This month marks 20 years since my grandmother passed away. She passed away three years before I was born, so I never got to meet her. I got to know a little bit about her through my family and looking at pictures and reading the book that she wrote. But I decided that I wanted to find out more about who my grandmother was. I wrote to Grandma Renee's brothers, Gene and Stanley, and asked them if they could tell me a little bit about what she was like as a kid. They told me some pretty funny stories. One funny story was that when she was younger, her family had a Mexican chihuahua named Chico that they had gotten from a bootlegger. And Chico liked to jump in the bathtub after Grandma Renee had emptied the water and we would drink the little water puddles left on the bottom of the tub. And there were a couple of times where she hadn't let the water out yet and the dog jumped in and splashed everywhere. She was a gifted evangelist. She was a fervent prayer warrior. She loved to tell others about Jesus, as well as being active in pro-life issues and defending the unborn. She'd even use cutting someone's hair as an opportunity to present the gospel to them while sitting in her barber chair. One time she brought gorgeous cupcakes to Jean and Deneen's house, and they sat down to have them and found out they were filled with styrofoam packing peanuts. It was April Fool's Day. When they would go shopping, she, a lot of the times, she would approach a complete stranger and act like she knew them and say things like, hi, I haven't seen you in so long. How have you been? How's the family? And the person that she was talking to had no clue as who she was and was trying to figure out how they knew her and totally confused. Next, I went to the person who probably knew her best, her husband of 25 years, my granddad. He is now to be among you at the calling of your heart. Rest assured. from the high school in a parking lot. I think it was the AMW. I had left school in Pepperoni. She had to. And I had gone to uh, the store in the cough cross with my friends with me. And her, her friend had skipped out to go and get something to the AMW. It was your place. And my friend knew her, and I said, oh, So we went over in the parking lot, and I met her for the first time. And while we were talking, because we stayed there long, she was talking, the principal and the dean pulls up in the car, and so our parents got to go, well, they never knew it. It happened to each other, but we both got suspended from school. Um, we were not supposed to go on campus at that time for a trip going. And our football team did not many games that year, so I wasn't going to really care. I was on the wrestling team, so I cared even less about the football team. But that's not first time. What really touched me the most at the point was probably uh, as a teenager, she said she wanted to go old with me. And girls never kind of talk like that back then, you know, especially in younger age. So that was a very um, not more endearing or whatever, but it was something that struck me that never heard anybody say at that age before. How old are you guys? When she said that, 16 ish. She was always frustrated by when people would get married, the, the, the women would not say I do very loud and be very quiet. So she kind of said it real loud and there was kind of a chuckle on the ground when she said that. Um, when I first met her, she was very young. 
Anna. I think she probably was a little fearful of me and what I thought. Uh, I know she was probably afraid of Fred because he told Grammy that she that they could that she couldn't be calling Frank. And Grammy said, uh, "Oh, you can't keep children from seeing each other." He's talking. She said, "Oh, yes, I can," and he did. Um, and then they married very young, and they really stepped up to the plate. They were just fantastic. She grew, they both grew as Christians, but they were like friends. And she was, I, th I always felt that she was the mother and Grammy was the child because she, she took care of Grammy more than Grammy took care of her. And she just, she grew into, they they grew into incredible people and they had a wonderful life together, I, I, as far as I know. Um, and I used to tease them about all the children. I said, well, you just have to hang them from the rafters. that as her ignition in life. Uh, she enjoyed it. She put her whole heart and soul into it. I, I would have probably never homeschooled my kids or even thought about homeschooling my children if it wasn't for knowing her and watching how they do it. They used to have a hot tub and they would all climb into the hot tub and you say, well look, the whole family's in this small portable hot tub in this another one of those compartment rooms. I think it was an area between rooms. <laughs> and all the kids are sitting in the, in, in the uh, hot tub just chilling out and relaxing as she reaches over the back she's got multiplication cards. So you're not just going to sit in there. So you're either going to do multiplication cards or this one with Bible verses. So boom, here you go. Everybody has to answer questions and it was, I hated it because it would come to my turn. And I'm like, Gail, I'm not ex I'm exempt, right? No, <laughs> didn't happen. So I probably relearned my multiplication tables in the hot tub. We always smiled at each other. She was really warm and wonderful to me. And when I first started seeing her as a midwife, I honored her as the expert because I was pregnant also. And it was my first and her fifth. <laughs> so she would tell me, ah, oh, don't worry about that. You're fine. And at the time, I didn't have a midwife. So she really did take the place of, um, I honored her. She knew everything she was doing. And um, I hoped I supported her half as well as she supported me. I mean, we were endeared friends then and it was wonderful knowing her and hopefully the same us to her we um she ended up giving birth like three days after shanti was born so i tried i tried to get out of the house but my husband would not let me go <laughs> and um jean madrid did was with her with her birth but Fortunately for me, there were more babies and I was able to be there. <laughs> there were some funny ones. <laughs> Darlene's birth. <laughs> I'm sorry, from my point of view, that was really hilarious. Um, what I recall is there was a restaurant in downtown Hollywood called Coral Rose. And my husband and I would often go there in the morning. And she called me and said, I'm going home from, she was working as a school guard. And she said, you know, I'm getting some strong cramps. I'm going to go home, which meant, oh, my God, because she never gave in to her cramping. 
So, <laughs> so is that okay? We're gonna stop and get breakfast. And I could tell she was sort of like, well, maybe not, but but go ahead. And so we ordered. And she called back and she said, ordered. I mean, we didn't get our food, nothing. She said, I, I, I'm going to start pushing soon. What? <laughs> we ran out of that restaurant so fast. It was hilarious. And somehow I got to her house, which I, I really don't even remember the trip over there, but I was driving and it was really fast. <laughs> and we like came in the door and she was sitting so sweetly on the captain's chair. She had a captain's chair that was lowered to make like a um a birth stool. <laughs> and Danielle was receiving the baby and she was looking in the mirror of the closet to see what it all looked like and Renee was. And my husband was sitting at the kitchen table. And she had baked a cake, or it was not made yet. She made a cake for a birthday, her baby's birthday. And within 10 minutes, she had the baby. And it was, then she stood up and said, well, that's that. <laughs> Which was really phenomenal. You know, it was... Um, I hope she found it as funny as, I mean, it just seemed really funny, but I know labor somewhere in there was really strong. And she just had such a, a marvelous respect for the birth process. She, you know, it was, it was an honor for her to go through labor. And she really trusted it and so she she just was amazing having your baby pick the baby up nurse the baby went and made the cake or had the cake at the table we were all sitting around the table eating birthday cake it was like really amazing she kind of had the more the merrier kind of attitude <laughs> like she was really blessed to have more kids and that um She didn't ever seem to really favor anybody. You know, it was just more to include and, and get going with it. And um, she taught me a great deal. I, I used to have a concern for big families. And um, she really taught me that if, if everybody works together, and that isn't aging kids too fast. I mean, some people go, Okay, now you take care of everybody else, and I'm going to the beauty parlor. She had her own beauty parlor. <laughs> um, it seemed as if everybody pitched in, shared the load, and did it at their level. So it was really good. And they, the kids were all really pretty great kids. Yeah. They all had their things they liked. They they were encouraged to do the things that they felt good about and so she had a lot of fulfilled kids yeah one of the things she liked was playing April Fool's jokes on people trying to get me and uh, I know at one point somebody made a cake out of drywall mud and it looked really good it looked like a cake and she ended up taking it to choir practice, and she was enjoying it. She was, I think maybe I made it, and she fell for it. So she was so excited to play it on somebody else, and she took it to choir practice, and everybody fell for it. I mean, it was such a perfect looking cake. And I remember one lady, I said, well, how did it go? She says, well, one lady sort of ate it. She said, it tastes so salty. So, and didn't, and didn't eat it, but uh, that was one time. Um, there was another time when we were living in a trailer, 
the guys next door dressed up in a um, like a gorilla outfit and she was washing the dishes in the sink and there was a window right there and he just kind of stuck his head at the window and she screamed and then figured out what it was he laughed so we got in my pickup truck and I had a frame on the back of it at the time uh, that I was using the paint off of so we put him in the back of it and we just drove down Oakland Park to the beach and he would just hang there and then we'd pull up at a light to people and he would just kind of look over in the window and people would scream and laugh and joke and she had the best time just, you know, doing that all the way down to the beach. And, uh, but practical jokes like that were what she kind of enjoyed doing and things like that. And it was just something spontaneous that would just happen. Um, you know, she liked doing that. Not much she couldn't do. You know. She was very young. I always had trucks, and she could drive a truck in any, any size, any shape, or size, anywhere we needed to go. Um, scary when I think back about some of the things going across the seven mile an hour, seven mile bridge and the keys to the truck, and you sleep in the back of it. You know. She could drive the boat. She was accomplished. Anything she wanted to do, she could do it. Um, she enjoyed working on the house. We kind of had to keep working on it because we kept out of more children to make more rooms for everybody and rearrange things. And I think she actually enjoyed doing that too. Um, working with me and working with Granddad. Most of working after we left, when I'd go to work and Granddad would leave because he didn't like her working on it. But she enjoyed tearing out walls and hammering stuff and you know, doing the demolishing work of it all. And she scooped it all up and get it ready for us the next day. Um, you know, she loved the church, she loved the Lord, she always enjoyed doing whatever she felt the Lord was leading her to do at the time. Lots of interest. She loved painting. Uh, you can see from the paintings back there. Uh, she started in her 40s, started painting. And, uh, she did art in high school. She had a mural at the school that was made out of tile. And she, so art was always in her blood to do. But she didn't do a lot of it uh, raising children until she got in her 40s. And then she started doing murals on the walls and said, well, let's do whatever you want. I said, I'm a painter. I can paint over if you don't like it. And from there, she just kind of got into it. And being a spurt, I'd just come home one day and all the paint stuff would be out and she'd be working on it. And then she would be done after a day or two. And then all of a sudden, two months later, I come home and there she got it all up and added to the painting. You know, sometimes it It'd be a year later she'd start adding something else to it. So you never knew what was gonna get painted. We did I showed her how to do sponge painting and that was a fad for the house at one point and everything got sponge painted cabinets. She actually sponge painted the the uh, countertop in the church and because they couldn't afford at the time to redo it. And she sponge painted it so beautiful that it stayed there for years until the church finally remodeled the whole bathrooms. But uh, and then whatever little fad that was out there, soul painting or anything, she learned how to do it and then get into it and do it. And then do everything that way for a while. So it changed to a new style and then she did that. Her artistic ability. If it stood still long enough, she painted it. She'd grab a brush and she painted. She loved the sea. She loved ocean motif. I mean, uh, you've seen the house. She painted it. I mean, she just would never stop painting it. Uh, she even took these windows and put these windows in the back. She was always trying to make the house more home. Uh, 
the house was incredible. It was a maze of rooms and compartments and areas. There was a schoolroom and a, a boys room and a girls room and a, another girls room and then there was Princess Donna's room. <laughs> and, uh, it, but there was these windows in the back and I, and I remember she decided she wanted to etch them. So she's out there with, I think, a sandblaster or something, and she's literally etching some scene in these windows. And uh, it was just incredible to, to watch her. I mean, with all the kids and everything that you have to do with the kids, she still found time to always make the house more home. And uh, she was quite an accomplished hairdresser. She cut people's hair, and I think she enjoyed doing that. And she, People like coming to her just because you talk to your hairdresser and she was a good counselor. She liked to listen and she had good advice. And uh, always had a Christ in her all her advice. I met her at what's now Rio Vista, Bethany. Uh, I do not remember the year. I had just become a new believer. I ran into this lady and she goes, hi, I'm Renee. Who are you? I've never seen you before. I says, my name's Mark. I, my first time here. And she said, God just told me that you're going to work with the youth. And she turned and walked away. And that's how I met your grandma. Uh, after my first meeting with her, uh, I think I saw her again the next Sunday and I believe she invited invited me to the house for something. Introduced me to her two daughters, uh, your mom and your Aunt Donna. And uh, I actually came friends with them also. And uh, I don't know, I can't remember why, but I was over at the house, I don't know if it were for prayer or for a lunch or something. And uh, I, I just started, you know, going over there and hanging out with uh, your granddad and your, and your grandma. And, and uh, and then as your mom grew a little older, started hanging out one more with her and, and Donna. She just kept inviting me over for prayer over at the house. And in the house, wooden floors, we would just sit around in the middle of the living room and pray and in a circle. And uh, she was just such a prayer warrior and she was just, you know, so loving and caring and, and you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm not a really good person, and you know, you're bringing in your family, but she never saw any of the bad stuff in me. She only saw that there was good, and God had a plan for my life, and, and she stuck to that and everything, you know. And uh, she was just a, a an inspiring, and encouraging, and loving person, who. And I don't want to say only saw the good in people because she saw bad and evil. I mean, she had great discernment right away. But if she saw or felt, I think that was it. She had a discernment that God gave her. And she saw those who God had a plan for and knew the ones that you need to stay away from. So, it's kind of, I think that sums her up, you know. Her ability to show Christ's love to show how to apply mercy and grace to someone who's undeserving. Uh, there, through our relationship, and it was actually towards, she started going through her trials, and her physical trials, and I had made a big mistake in life, and uh, she didn't stop loving me or caring for me. As a matter of fact, she grabbed me one day and hugged me and she goes, God still loves you. I still love you. I still believe in you. And she stood by my side when a lot of other people did not. You know, I, I do remember a really special day and, and it's not just about her, it's, but it was about her, uh, like I said before, when she sees someone who belongs in a ministry and God, she knows God has a plan and God's told her she, they have a plan, she doesn't quit. 
she called called me one day or saw me one day and she goes you're coming over to the house Sunday afternoon at whatever after church or whatever uh, we're gonna play we're gonna pray for a friend of mine so we get over there and of course where we are on the wooden floor sitting around and she introduces me to this guy named Rich Rick Andreas Andreas and she goes this is Rick known as coach Rick uh, he's got this ministry he's trying to start uh, Saints uh, it's a homeschool physical education and I think at the time he had maybe eight nine kids and we're gonna pray that this ministry really takes off because he is the man for the job he's the greatest guy in the world well if anybody knows who coach Rick is or knows Saints uh, and they're in the homeschool well Renee was one of those or she was so inspirational in that and she was just I mean we sat around that room we prayed for I don't even know how many hours over coach Rick that that ministry would take off and uh, like I said at that time very few I think you had some cousins in there that he was working with or something, right? it was our family and the foremans I think right it was two families right and that was it that was Saints and uh, down the road later on, I mean, when I raised my kids and homeschooled them, Coach Rick, you know, they were there. They, they never missed a, a Wednesday or whatever day it was, I think they went to. And, uh, but that was one of the beginnings of his ministry. So uh, one time a pastor told me that, uh, and maybe if you only encourage five people in your life, you don't know who one of them is going to be. And for her, like, you know, having Coach Rick and the amount of kids and lives that he has touched, she's part of that because, of, you know, when, when I got the text the other day, I started thinking about her and just uh, the influence in my life. If I think too much, I get emotional. <laughs> but uh, she was so wonderful. I mean, like I said, she was one of those people that never stopped believing in me. And uh, I was going through some struggles in my life and a situation that had happened. And uh, she didn't give up. Not at all. And uh, even though I'm still not the best person in the world, uh, you know, try to use her guidance and continue to grow myself. So, raise my kids. Convinced my wife to homeschool. What did you admire about her? Her strength, her conviction, her faith, her love of family, um, her peace. Um, her value for what she believed to be right with, like with homeschooling. Mostly, she, she was just a most wonderful friend. And she was a serious friend. I mean, she figured out if you needed something and, and took care of it and really did that. She had courage. She trusted. She knew if she did the right thing, the right thing was going to work out. Um, and she had faith in it. Yeah, she was something. As Christians, we're called to be lights to the world. But I think Grandma Renee did more than that. She was a light.